Well, good morning. It is good to have you here on an unbelievably beautiful day. Glad that you've uh, chosen to spend some time with us here, uh, here in Bellingham. Those of you in Skagit and those of you watching online at the live stream, glad that you're with us. Before we get into today's talk, I want to take just a minute uh, to uh, thank uh, some of you and also give glory to God. You know that the last two weeks around here have been very big weeks with Easter and then the following week, last weekend with our special guest, Daryl Strawberry. And I know that literally hundreds of you spent... Um, time in prayer, preparing for that weekend. Many of you uh, spent time in prayer and fasting that God would do what only God could do, and that is to plant uh, seeds of truth in the hearts of people and, and to change lives. Many of you served and volunteered and prepared, and, uh, and you invited your friends and your family. You, you shared it on social media, and just so grateful for uh, your involvement with that, and I wanted to thank you for that. And I am going to be sharing more about uh, some great stories that came out of these last two weekends at our Cornwall celebration in a week and a half, but a couple things I did want to report back. Because of your willingness to pray, to volunteer, to invite, to share, we had by far here in Bellingham and Skagit in our online community, by far the largest Easter attendance we've ever had in the history of this church. And it's not just about numbers, it's about people hearing the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ, that he can transform lives and that he's alive and well today. And so we just praise God for you. Yeah, thanks for your involvement with that. The other thing that you're familiar with is that every year for the last 12 years, we've given away our entire Easter offering. All of that money is given away outside of the walls of Cornwall. It doesn't pay any bills around here. It doesn't pay water bills or sewer bills or light bills. It doesn't pay any ministry budgets or any salaries. It does nothing here at Cornwall. It all goes outside the walls to bring help and hope and healing to our world locally, regionally, and globally. And you've been so generous. And on Easter weekend and the following week, you... Uh, uh, we collectively gave $82,550 for that. Yeah, so um, praising God for that. And also just, uh, again, our commitment that every single penny of that will go outside the walls of this. Also on to report, because this is the 12th year that we've done this, this year's offering on just our Easter offerings alone put us over the $1 million mark of what we've been able to give away just in our Easter offerings over the last 12 years. So just thanking God for the generosity of this church and that you would not only care about those outside of the church, but put your, literally your money where your mouth is. And I wondered before we went any further, if we could just pause together to thank God and pray that he would continue his ongoing work in what he's doing in our midst. Would you pray with me? Uh, Jesus, we are grateful that we serve a risen Savior, that you are alive. And we're, we're thankful for what you are doing in our midst. We're thankful for the people that were able to hear the truth. We're thankful for the next steps that people took. And God, we pray that as people are taking next steps in their spiritual journey, that you would protect them. Lord, you have said in your word that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And the seeds of the gospel, Lord, I pray that those would have fallen on fertile soil, uh, that it would not be something that would be choked out, but it would, it would take root and it would, it would produce a flourishing life that is fruitful for your glory. God, we're thankful for, uh, for this church and the generosity. And God, we pray that the dollars were able to come alongside other organizations and ministries and, and help out in this world, that, that it would truly bring beauty into this world, that it would bring your kingdom to bear here on earth now. And Lord, that because of all that, again, you would be glorified. So we pray that you would just continue your work. We're thankful for your goodness to us. And we just pray this all in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The one thing that we all have in common, the one thing that unifies all of us, regardless of your age, your gender, your race, your education, your economic background, your political leanings, one thing that we all have in common is that we are all hopers. That you never outgrow this need for hope. We, we never, never get too old to hope. And for most of us, what we long for is a hope that's beyond just a shallow wishful thinking or some kind of a, a groundless optimism. That is more than just positive thinking. We, we want a hope. We need a hope that can stare life in the face, even in its darkest, worst moments, without wavering, without blinking, without backing down to have that kind of hope. And the writer of Hebrews speaks about a hope that is like that. In the writing of Hebrews, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. I mean, the very word picture that he uses, an anchor for the soul. 
Not something that's, that's easily moved, something that can keep us secure even when the tides rise, when the tides fall, when the waves crash and the wind blows, when the storm is raging, when the currents are strong. There's something that gives us a security, something that's firm for the deepest parts of who we are, our soul, to have that kind of a hope. And I think that in our world today, and especially in America, we're in a hope crisis. There's a desire and a need for hope, but there seems to be a lack of hope. Now, I don't want to uh, bore you with all of my childhood, but when I was about 10 years old, in 1973, I walked to school. Now, unlike your parents, it was not uphill both ways. It was not snowing, and I had shoes. So your parents had it way worse than I did. But I walked to school, uh, to Lincoln Elementary School there in, in Vancouver, Washington, every morning, and that fall especially... As my friends and I would walk up Main Street, there on the corner of Main and 39th Street, there would be this long row of cars stretched out, parked onto Main Street, waiting idly, trying to get into Gary Reed's Texaco. Because some of you may remember in 1973, the OPEC nations did this embargo on oil, and there was an oil crisis. There was a shortage of gas, and you could only buy gas on certain days of the week, depending on your license plate number, and you could only buy so many gallons of gas. There was a crisis. There was a shortage of gas. And I think today we live in a, in, a, in a similar crisis, but it's a shortage of hope. And there's this desire and this longing. We need hope. We, we're longing for a, a hope that's an anchor for our soul. And yet, where do we find it? And I can give you all kinds of statistics that would back up that we are in a hope crisis. And you don't need statistics. Some of you say, I am the statistic. My life, my world, I feel hopeless. I need a hope that's an anchor for my soul. I will share this with you. In the United States, the Center for Disease Control has reported that in the last three years, the average life expectancy of Americans has actually declined each of the last three years. This is the first time it's happened in America in over 100 years, and America is the only industrialized nation that, that is experiencing this. What makes this even more strange is that the number one and number two killers of Americans, heart disease and cancer, are actually on the decline and people over 80 are actually living longer. And what they found is that in this segment of our society, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, the 25 to 45 year old segment of our society is suffering from what two uh, Princeton professors have titled, diseases of despair. And the, the amount of alcoholism and opioid use and drug abuse and suicide in the 25 to 45, it doesn't, it just exists there, but in that has become so rampant that it has taken the average life expectancy uh, rates in the United States down for three straight years. There's a desperate need. We are desperately and literally dying of hopelessness. A man uh, named Dr. Shane Lopez, who is considered the leading researcher on hope, has said this about hope, that hope is not just an emotion, but an essential life tool. We don't just need a pep talk. We don't just need to feel better for a day. We need something deeper than that. We need something, and, and we, we must have it. Now, in this series, we're talking about hope beyond, because when it feels like, like we're beyond hope, we need a hope that's beyond that, something that can anchor our lives, and we can base our, our, our found our lives on this firm and secure for our soul. The foundation verse for the entire, uh, the entire series is a verse that I talked about on Easter weekend. I talked about it last weekend with Daryl. I'll talk about it today. We'll talk about it next weekend, and actually the weekend after that, I'm going to talk about it. In fact, you might as well just go ahead and memorize this one because we're going to bring it up again and again and again. And it was written by a guy who had experienced the highest levels of hopefulness and the deepest levels of hopelessness. And he writes it, his name is Peter, and he writes it in a letter, and he writes these words, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're going to come back to this again and again and again. So you might as well, like I said, you might as well memorize it. It's a great one that God has given us his new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What's amazing, and next week, We'll see who this was written to, the backstory, their circumstance, and why this was so significant for them in what they were going through in life. But what we find with this is that there's a direct co uh, connection and a correlation between their hope and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So many times in the church, and again, especially in America, Easter is a holiday that comes and goes every year. 
It came, it went. Now we put the bunnies away, we put the rabbits away. I guess those are the same things. We put the chickens away, we put it all away, and then we finish up our Cadbury cream er eggs and our Whopper Robin Robin eggs and our our chocolate Easter bunnies that are hollow and all that. So we get all done with that. Easter's done because now we gotta get ready for prom and graduation and that wedding and mow the lawn and it's boating season and there's barbecues. So Easter has come and gone. But the early followers of Jesus did not see Easter as 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 a holiday or a season that came and went. For them, they discovered that the stone had been rolled away, the tomb was empty, Jesus was alive, and nothing would ever be the same again. That everything had changed at that point. It wasn't just a season. What they now experienced was living in the reality of the resurrection. This wasn't a season they experienced once a year. This was a reality they lived in every single day. So you see this resurrection of Christ and the new birth into a living hope are inextricably tied together. The reason there's a living hope is because Jesus is living. If Jesus is dead, hope is dead. They put them together and they never saw them separated from each other. That's why in this series, we wanna look at what does it mean for us to not just celebrate Easter a few weeks ago, but to live in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus every single day so that we can have this living hope as well. It's interesting, in the New Testament, not not the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, which talks about Jesus' life and the church beyond that. In the New Testament, in the first part that talks about Jesus' life up to his death and resurrection, the word hope is used once. After the resurrection, through the rest of the New Testament, the word hope is used 80 times. There was something that happened with this fact that Jesus is alive that brought this hope and it was a a center point, It it was a focal point for them in their lives and how they lived every single day to have this hope. And they discovered something and you will discover this if you look at New Testament hope, you will discover this truth that we have got to grasp because otherwise we'll always be going after something that is not biblical hope. What they found and what we need to find is that it's not just what we hope for, but who we hope in. It's not just, I hope this happens, I hope I get this, I hope this change. It's, this is my hope, my hope is in this one. The one that's alive, the one that's back from the dead. So what I want us to do today in our time together is I wanna look at a, a circumstance, a situation that happened in Peter's life. Since he's the one that wrote this verse, he knows firsthand about hopelessness, hopefulness, death, resurrection, all of that. And I wanna look at a circumstance and a situation that brought him to a point of utter hopelessness and how that was resurrected into a living hope. If you've been with us throughout the winter and the early spring, you know that we spent 15 weeks going through the book of Mark. And I'm going to today, if you'll give me grace, even if you don't, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm gonna circle back around into the book of Mark one more time, and we're gonna look at a situation that we skimmed over, we didn't have time to hit everything. And it's looking at some things that happened in Peter's life. If you remember, the book of Mark is most likely Peter's experience with Jesus that he says to Mark and Mark writes it down. And Peter's experience with Jesus starts off this way. In the early uh, verses of the, of the book, Mark chapter one, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, also called Peter, also called Cephas. You say, well, what, which one is it? That's like someone who's named William can also be called Bill and also called Billy. It's just, it's the same name, okay? So you got Simon, Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, and then Jesus says, follow me. When Jesus says to Peter, follow me, it opens up this life of hope like he never dreamed even possible, that he doesn't have to deal with these fish anymore, that he gets to be with this rabbi Jesus, that he gets to be a part of this life-changing endeavor. And for the next three years, his whole life was this crescendo of hope that got higher and higher and higher as he would hear Jesus teach and he would talk about the kingdom of God and he would talk about how God is on our side and he wants the best for us. And he would see the miracles that Jesus had done. He was there when the water was turned into wine, when the lame walked, when the blind saw, when the deaf heard. And then there were those moments like like when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the little girl was raised from the dead, when the 5,000 were fed, when the 4,000 were fed, when he actually took a couple steps on water. He was there for all of that and his hope got bigger and bigger and as it was escalating as it was crescendoing up he knew that this would result in the Messiah bringing into this kingdom here on earth and then there was this last night it was a weird night I mean there was the 
the symbolism of the Passover and all the deep meaning, the rich meaning it had for them as a nation and them as a people and who they were. But that night it was weird. I mean, Jesus is talking about stuff that doesn't make sense, a new covenant, his blood, broken bodies, and what he did when he washed their feet, this was crazy talk. And then they left that upper room and somewhere, somewhere between that upper room where they had the Last Supper and Gethsemane, on that walk across the Kidron Valley, there's a conversation that took place. And we find it in Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 27. And Jesus says to his disciples, there's 11 of them now, Judas has gone off, there's 11 of them. He looks at them and he says, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, and here he quotes Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. This made no sense to them. Why is he quoting Zechariah? What's the deal with the sheep and the shepherds? And what's the thing about risen and going into Galilee? He doesn't understand any of it. No, none of them do. But they do know what he says, and, and it's hard to imagine when he says, you will all fall away. And I can imagine them walking. You know, now it's, it's probably 9, 10, 11 at night. They're walking in the dark, and it's like, what's he talking about? And they're just kind of looking at each other. And Peter, as always, cannot remain silent. And he responds and says, even if all fall away, I will not. I will not fall away. You know, these other guys, maybe they will. But, but Peter separates himself from the crowd, from, from the other disciples. He said, you know, the, these guys back here, the, these 10 guys, I don't know where Judas is, but these 10 guys, they'll all fall away maybe, but not me, I will. And because Peter singles himself out, Jesus says, okay, I'll single you out as well. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Now, you gotta understand this. When Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it doesn't mean he's been lying up to this point, okay? I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone and they say, okay, I'm gonna be really honest now. <laughs> okay, what, you've been lying this whole time? <laughs> hey, have you ever had those conversations with, can I be honest? No, 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 please, tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. It'd be better for all of us. No, okay, so when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he's not saying, okay, now, now, now I'm gonna be honest, okay? Some of you old school, you remember, verily, verily, I say unto you, okay, another translation, truly, truly. When he says, I tell you the truth, it's not like everything else was falsehood. What he's saying is, you can be assured that what I am saying here is without a doubt gonna happen. Like, there's no question about this. He says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Now he's talking to Peter. Peter singled himself out and said, these guys are all gonna fall away, but not me. And Jesus says, okay, listen, Peter, I, I, I just wanna tell you something. You can, you can be assured of this, that tonight, tonight, like tonight, before the rooster crows, this is gonna happen. It's interesting, on the, on the south side of, of Old Town Jerusalem, there's a church, a, a church today. It's called the Church of St. Peter in Galicantu. I don't often say Galicantu, but when I say Galicantu on Cinco de Mayo, I have chips and salsa. <laughs> the church in, of St. Peter in Galicantu. Galicantu means like rooster crow, cock crow. The church in, 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 in Galicantu is traditionally believed to be where the house of Caiaphas, the, ha, uh, the high priest, was. And the church has got a lot of amazing things. There in, in the basement, there's this dungeon where it is believed traditionally that maybe Jesus was held in this dungeon cell while he's waiting for the Sanhedrin to come together for their court that night. It's also the place where historically Peter would have denied Christ three times and the, and the rooster would have crowed. And so you see a, an evidence of roosters around. There's statues of a rooster. Inside the chapel, there's this mosaic on the ceiling of roosters and all this. There's also outside of the church, this 2,000 year old stairway, this, these steps that, that are literally 2,000 years old. And it's one of the areas where, you know, like 99.8% sure Jesus walked on these stairs right here. But an interesting thing about this church is the doors. The doors going into this church are made of brass, heavy doors, and they've got a, like, like a, a relief um, sculpture on them, like this 3D sculpture that protrudes off of the door. And I've got a picture, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the doors, this relief uh, kind of sculpture on the door is depicting the scene that we just read because it has Jesus here pointing towards Peter and, the, and his hand comes out of the door, pointing towards Peter saying, you know, you will deny me. And Peter's like, hey, 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 not me. Here's the interesting thing. It's a beautiful piece of artwork, 
But it's very sobering because the doorknob is on Peter's door. And when you open that door and you walk into the church, Jesus points at you. And as you walk into this church and you look at the door to the left, the eyes of Jesus and his fingers point at you as if to say, are you any better than Peter? You will deny me too. You're gonna fail too. It's a part of life. And this happens, back to verse 30. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight. Before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Jesus, even if tonight we lose our lives, we're not gonna fall away, we're not gonna disown you. And it's one of those times where Jesus just kind of lets it lie. It's like, okay, we're not gonna argue about this. And across the Kidron Valley they go. It's a short walk over into Gethsemane where Jesus has now his 11 disciples and he leaves, uh, he leaves eight of them there and then he takes G Peter, James, and John a little farther into the garden with him and then he leaves them and he goes a little bit farther and there's that, that anguish where he prays, where he pours out his heart, where he's sweating drops of blood. And then Judas shows up with the mob and they arrest Jesus and all of the disciples scatter and they take Jesus back to Caiaphas' place for this gathering of the Sanhedrin for this court. And scripture says, while all the disciples scattered, Peter followed from afar. In the distance, Peter was wanting to see what's gonna happen. He's not right there with them. He's still scared, but he goes and he's kind of in the shadows behind them and he sees they go to Caiaphas' house and there below Caiaphas' house is this courtyard, and it's now maybe midnight, one in the morning, we don't know, but it's late at night, and there's a fire going, and there's guards and soldiers around, and, and Peter just kind of comes in with them, is just warming himself by the fire, kind of unnoticed by anybody. And then it says this, verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. Now, what a young servant girl is doing up at two in the morning, who knows, except that maybe she was awakened to saying, hey, we're having the Sanhedrin gather. We gotta get things together. We need your help. Get up. We gotta have your help here. But she notices Peter and she looks closely because he looks familiar. How? I don't know. Maybe it's because Jesus had been in the temple every day that week and Jesus had actually drawn attention to himself in the temple when he overthrew the table of the money changers and the dove sellers and all this was going on, people knew who Jesus was and Peter was always there with them. And he taught there in the portico, every single day he taught there in Solomon's colonnade and people would gather around and Peter would have been there and maybe this servant girl had gone to the temple, maybe she had seen him and now she recognizes, she looks closely, it's dark, but no, he's the one, he was, he was with that Nazarene Jesus. And Peter's response, he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Now, some of us who are familiar with this, what happens at night, sometimes we get to think it was deny, deny, deny. Er, er, er. Maybe it was. But maybe it was over the span of four or five hours. Maybe this is an hour or so later. We don't know. But now he goes out into a different place, so away from there. And the girl sees him again. It says, you were with them, and again, he denies it. And maybe he goes somewhere else. And maybe some time passes. Because a little while later, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. There was something about him that gave away the fact that he was not a local boy. You're not from these parts. Maybe it was his accent. Maybe it was his dress. Oh, we don't know, but how, so there was something like, you're not from here. You're from Galilee. We can tell that. Jesus and his guys are from Galilee. This little girl's been saying, you're one of his guys. We can tell you're from Galilee. This is too coincidental. This isn't an accident that you're here. You're from Galilee. You're one of them. He began to call down curses on himself, using this profanity, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about, and immediately the rooster crowed. I'm not a farmer. I don't know a lot about chickens. I know in the books that I read as a little boy, and in the movies and the cereal commercials, that roosters crow right when the sun comes up over the horizon, ideally. But I also understand roosters crow whenever they want to. So this may have been well before the sunrise 
This was probably somewhere in, and those of you who raise roosters can tell me, probably in the 4 to 6 a.m. time period. So Peter has been up all night long, and now he's denying Jesus for the third time. And he's calling down these curses upon himself. And he's swearing, and he's swearing to them that he doesn't know who this man is. And then the rooster crows. This moment marks the biggest failure of Peter's entire life, past, present, and future. Peter's made a lot of mistakes. He's done a lot of dumb things. I mean, just hours before, he cut off Malchus's ear and Jesus had to fix it. A couple days before that, he rebukes Jesus and Jesus calls him the devil. A few weeks before that, he's on the Mount of Transfiguration and in this holy moment, he says, let's set up camp. And Moses and Elijah disappear. Way to go, Pete. He tried walking on water and you know how that turned out. He's made a lot of mistakes. But this marks the biggest failure of his life. And it's interesting. In Luke's account of what happens, Luke adds a detail into his gospel that Peter and Mark don't put in the book of Mark. It's interesting. Luke says this. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. I wonder what message was sent in that look. Here's Peter denying, he's swearing, he's cursing, he's going on, he's animated. And when he says, I don't even know this guy you're talking about, and he turns and his eyes connect with Jesus and they are locked. What is the message in that look? Because a lot can be said with just a look. If you've ever been married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you were ever a kid or if you ever had kids, you know what I'm talking A lot can be said in just a look. And I wonder, what was the message that Jesus said with that look? Was it a message of disappointment? Of, of anger? Of hurt? A smugness, see, I told you. A vengeance, just wait till I come back. What was that look? What message was he sending Peter? Let me ask you this. I'm not saying that you have all sinned. Actually, the Bible said that. But what about those times when we have denied Christ? When we've sinned, when we failed, when we did what we promised him that would never happen again? What about those times when we knowingly went away. What did the eyes of Jesus say to us? Was it anger? Was it hatred? Was it disgust? Was it disappointment? I want to suggest that when Jesus saw Peter and their eyes connected, what Peter experienced were eyes filled with love and compassion and hope. Because what Luke also records is that earlier that night there was a conversation that Jesus and Peter had when Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back, that you will strengthen your brothers. And maybe at that moment when his eyes meet Peter's eyes, he, what he longs for is don't let this be the defining moment of your life. Don't let this take you out of the game. Don't let this cause your faith to fail. Don't let this be the end of the story, Peter. I know you messed up. You know you messed up. But I'm telling you, I've got love and I've got compassion and I've got hope that you will turn around and when you do, you will strengthen your brothers. And maybe, just maybe, when Jesus looks at us in our sins and our fall, falling shorts and our failures, and I'm not in any way diminishing the severity of sin, but maybe when he looks at us, he has nothing but compassion and love and hope that we will find the living hope in him. Well, it goes on, and Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Do you think this is a little bit of an understatement? I'm not asking for a show of hands, but some of you know, if you're like me, some of you know 
that self-loathing when you've made a decision, when you've made a choice, when you've done something that you are so angry at yourself for. There's not only disappointment, there's absolute disgust, self-hatred. Why did I do that? What was I thinking? How could I be so stupid? And that goes up even to a higher level when our decision impacts and hurts someone else whom we love. What that did to my wife, what that did to our kids, what that did to the, whatever it might have done, that that decision, it didn't just affect me and my stupidity, but it hurt others. And Peter lives with this as he's weeping. It's Friday morning early. He runs out and he's crying and he's filled with self-hatred and loathing and it's not in the pit of his stomach. And throughout the day when Jesus is crucified, the sky grows dark and Peter may not even notice it because his whole world is dark. He is at the utter point of hopelessness because of his own doing. And maybe that night he wanders back to that room where all the disciples are and they say, Peter, did you hear? Jesus is dead. Peter hasn't slept in 36 hours or more. And that night as he lays there, there's no sleep. It eludes him. He hasn't eaten. As he lays in bed, the tears stream down his face. And there are these moments when he drifts off to sleep, but he's awoken by a nightmare. And there's that split second when you think, oh good, I'm glad it was a nightmare. And then you realize it's not a nightmare. It's the truth. And Saturday, Saturday drug on forever. Not only what he had done, not only what had happened to Jesus. Now what's gonna happen with all of this? And still can't eat, and Saturday night sleep continues to elude him. And Sunday morning, no one's expecting a resurrection. No one's expecting a happy ending. It's the first day of the week. Listen, I know you've had some rough Monday mornings, but I guarantee you nothing compares to that first day of the week that Peter experienced. A new week. How do we go on? How do I go on? Well, what do we do now? It's hopeless. And as we saw a couple weeks ago, the ladies go to the tomb and they meet a man there. Mark chapter 16 says, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen, he's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples. Like Jesus isn't here. Go tell his disciples. There's two more words that are profound, and Peter. Tell his disciples and Peter. I always thought that meant that Peter was no longer a part of the club. Like, you got the disciples. But Peter has disqualified himself. They pulled his card. He doesn't have membership anymore. So go tell the disciples, oh, and while you're at it, talk to loser Pete over there as well. I don't think that's the case. I think what he's saying is, you go tell the disciples and whatever you do, I don't care who else you tell. You make sure that Peter hears this because he might be off crying somewhere or he might be off beating himself up somewhere and I need to make sure that when you go back and tell the disciples, you look around and if Peter's not there, you find him and you tell him. You tell the disciples and Peter. Tell him what? Jesus is back and he is ticked off. (laughs) No, that's not what he said. Go and tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you, just as he said. And some time passes and and there's this unbelievable disbelief, excitement, anticipation, uh, uh, uncertainty, expectation, because over the next week or two, Jesus just randomly shows up at certain times. There's no schedule. And when they get together, they're they're probably always wondering, you think he'll show up tonight? I don't know. And sometimes he'll just all of a sudden, like, there he is. And they go on back to Galilee and they're waiting. And I'm thinking Peter's probably going, guys, I'm just going fishing. I, I think in those weeks, I don't know how many there are, but I think in those weeks, Peter is uncharacteristically quiet. Not as cocky and bold as he always was. He's just kind of quiet. Guys, I'm going to go fishing. It's all I know. It's the only thing I'm good at. It's what I should have been doing the whole time. They're like, we'll go with him. So they all go fishing. And to add insult to injury, 
Peter knows these waters. The only thing he's good at is fishing. Doesn't catch anything. Kind of like some of you. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so early in the morning, there's this guy on the shore and he goes, hey guys, fellas, did you get anything? How was fishing tonight? Eh, not so good. And Jesus says, um, why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? This may have been the exact place where there was an earlier miraculous catch three years ago with this guy named Jesus. And they throw the nets on the other side and there's all of these fish. And all of a sudden they realize, that's Jesus. And Peter, in typical Peter fashion, says, I don't have time to row my, my boat ashore jumps in and swims. I've got to find Jesus. There he is. He runs in there. And then they had this breakfast. They all come in. They have this fish. It's wonderful. They have this breakfast around the campfire and Jesus is there. And then it's time for the talk. Not that talk. The talk. And I think Peter knows this was inevitable. I've been dreading it, but it has to happen. And after they've had breakfast, they have the talk. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And some of you who know the story know that this conversation happens three times, back to back to back. And the obvious answer is, Peter denied him three times. Now Jesus is going to say, okay, three times you're going to have to tell me you love me. Eye for an eye, we're going to kind of even the score here. But could it have been that it wasn't about you denied me three times, now I need to hear you tell me you love me three times? I don't think Jesus operates that way. Could it be that Jesus wanted to reassure Peter beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loved him, Jesus was not through with him, and while he may have failed, he was not a failure. That Jesus wants to really communicate to him, while you may have failed, you're not disqualified because every time he says, you know I love you, he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, take care of my flock. While you may have failed, that failure is not your identity. So many times in our lives, we are identifying ourselves by our addictions, by our failures, by our mistakes, by our sins. Our families do, our friends do, even the church does sometimes. And Jesus comes along and says, you might have messed up, but that is not who you are. Your identity is not in your biggest failure. Your identity is in Christ Jesus. And I want to give you a new birth into a living hope. I'm not done with you. And what Peter discovers that day is what Frederick Buechner said, is that the worst thing is not the last thing. The worst thing that had ever happened in human history, that Jesus had been crucified and laid into the tomb, it was the worst thing, but it was not the last thing. The worst thing that had ever happened in Peter's life was that he had denied Christ three times. It was the worst thing, but it was not the last thing. That that is not the end of the story. That there would be more. And after that conversation, I love this out of John 21. It says, then he said to him, then Jesus said to Peter, and don't let it happen again. <laughs> nope. You owe me big. Nope. Usually I'm a three strikes and you're out. We'll count that third one as a foul tip. You've got one more pitch coming. Nope. Remember, it was three years earlier after a miraculous catch when Jesus spoke two words to Peter that opened up a life of hope. And three years after his feeling like he was beyond hope, that it was hopeless, his biggest failure, on the same beach very possibly, Jesus said to him, follow me. The same words that he started on this life of hope three years earlier. Follow me. Peter, you remember that? You remember the hope you had? It's not over. It's time for a new birth into a living hope. You follow me, and I will give you a life of hope.
can, can we take this whole story and make it personal? Because there might be some of you here today that your identity is caught up in your biggest failure. Who you are, who you see yourself as. And it's, it's kept you down. And yeah, I, I'm not saying that it wasn't a big deal. It, it, maybe it was a huge deal. Maybe it hurt a lot of people. Maybe it was your failure in your marriage. Maybe it was your failure as a parent. Maybe it was your failure in society with the law. Maybe it was a failure in your addiction and recovery. Maybe it was a, a failure financially or with your job. I don't know what it is. But in the midst of that failure, maybe it was a moral failure. Maybe it was a sin. Maybe it was going, knowingly going against God's word. In the midst of that failure, Jesus looks at you eye to eye with a message of love and compassion and hope saying, follow me. Follow me into a new birth of a living hope. You are not your biggest failure. I have hope for you beyond your failure. That's a beautiful thing about this living, risen Savior of ours, Jesus. And one more thing about hope is that it's hope not just beyond events of failure. It's hope beyond the whole category of failure. That's why we're going to spend weeks looking at this, hope. A man named David Bryant said this, hope is not a verb, hope is a noun. Hope is not a verb, it's not something you do. Hope is a noun. Hope isn't just like saying, okay, I, I've got I've to fill myself with positive affirmations. I've got to fill myself with, with cool little slogans that pump me up and, and get me all jacked up and, and, and face another. That's fine. I'm, I'm all about positive thinking. That's wonderful. I love optimistic people. That's great. But the hope the Bible talks about is not something we do. It's someone we know. It's Jesus. And if our hope is Jesus, then as Christians, we will never ever be hopeless. If our hope is Jesus, we will never have any circumstance, any situation, any day of our life that is without hope. Because our hope is not what we do. It's who he is. Okay, one more verse, then I'll stop. Paul writes this letter. It's called Colossians. He writes this letter, and in this letter, he talks about this, this mystery this mystery that's been hidden for ages, for generations, for, for millennia, but it's been revealed. He says this in Colossians 1. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. That's us. This is good. This is for us. To them God has made, uh, chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. This mystery that if we could understand this mystery, if we could grasp this as our reality, if we could live in this mystery, we would be well on our way to a life of hope. Here's the mystery, seven words. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not what you're hoping for, it's who your hope is in. And it's Christ who dwells within you, that means hope lives within you, that's a new birth into a living hope because Christ is our hope and he dwells within us. Can I get an amen anywhere? I feel like we're a bunch of Scandinavian Lutherans here. Someone say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, nothing against Scandinavian Lutherans. I don't even know any. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the good news, friends. And when we have that hope, no matter what circumstance we ever face, we have hope beyond that because the hope is in Christ. Listen, if you're carrying around your biggest failure, if in your mind it has disqualified you, if it's become your identity right now, would you look into the eyes of the one who has compassion and love and hope for you and hear him say, follow me, follow me. I will give you new birth into a living hope. And I pray that as we continue in this study that we will understand what it means to live in the reality of the resurrection that Jesus Christ is alive and he lives within us. Hope dwells within us. Christ in you, the hope for glory, hope of glory, and that we are in Christ Jesus. Anyway, I'm excited about this series. I'm excited as we live in this hope. Why don't you stand? We're gonna sing the song that Ron wrote. It talks about this hope. It talks about when we were down and out and, and how God brings us to us. We'll sing this and then I'll close this in prayer.